I'm going to talk today about something a little bit different than what I'm not sure what the um, agenda now says. The um, theme that was chosen for this to topic or this day was done in this order. Molly called me and said, guess what, you just won. I said, explain it to me. Guess when it is. You have to make a speech. And you have to give me the title of the speech right now. I said, Molly, you choose one. I will talk about whatever I want to at the time. And <laughs> Hopefully, they will match somehow. <laughs> the topic that we chose was what would America be like, or what would it be without capitalism? I'm not going to talk about that directly, but I will indirectly. But I do want to challenge everyone here to contemplate the answer to that question and do it for the rest of your lives. Do it thinking about and contemplating also what the answer to that question will mean to the next generation and to all future generations. Today I want to talk a little bit about conservatism. I want to talk about how well we as conservatives really understand exactly what conservatism is and what all it encompasses. I'm on, at the end of this, and that will not be too long from now, I'm going to deli deliberately take a good bit of time at the end to take questions and receive comments. But what I would hope that we accomplish today together is a fairly open discussion about what conservatism is, where we do things well, where perhaps we don't, do not do things as well as we should. Now, it's always nice to know your audience. I do not want to presuppose anything about your philosophical beliefs. So if you don't mind, those of you who consider the primary basis for your philosophy to be conservatism, would you mind raising your hands and keeping them up for a moment? Well, I guess that fairly accurately. Thank you. A second question similar to that. How many of you feel that capitalism is the primary focus of your philosophy. Interesting. Keep them up a little bit so we can look around. I think that you just wrote the rest of my speech today. I think that both of those philosophies are pretty close to each other. I thought about starting this comment by saying, my name is Fred. I am a, cap a capitalist. I was concerned that you may think that I was getting ready to embark on an acknowledgement before Alcoholics Anonymous, so I decided not to do that. But in a way, I would like to by saying something similar to that. I am a capitalist, but I'm not trying to kick the habit. I believe that capitalism is the most important thing that we as conservatives have to deal with. And I think it's important for us to know exactly what capitalism means, what conservatism means. So let's start with the notion that most of us do have a pretty good feel for. It's what we associate with in the two organizations that we are dealing with here who are co-sponsoring this entire day in the forum. They are conservative organizations. You need to know that you heard part of it in the, my introduction. I know a lot of you. Many of you know that I have been involved in the Republican Party for a number of years. I was admonished that this was a nonpartisan meeting. So I pledged that I would not do anything that made me seem to be a partisan. I suspect that I will do that as best I can, and I suspect that I will fail mightily in keeping that pledge, because I don't know that you can talk about conservatism or liberal philosophy without understanding the two primary political parties that we have in this country and how they relate to it. But my objective is not to be partisan in what I say. My objective is to find out where we really are in terms of our ability to put forth the message of capitalism. So let's talk about it for a moment. 
in my judgment, I ask you how you feel about capitalism, how you feel about conservatism. If I ask each one of you, most of you raised your hands with respect to conservatism, but I suspect that very few people in this room would all point to exactly the same definition of that term. And the reason is not because you may be somewhat lazy in understanding what you believe in, as much as I am convinced that part of the problem has been the way conservatives deal with that definition, largely in the context of a political campaign, in the Republican Party, where obviously most conservative candidates seek office in the primary, most of them trying to get pretty far, quote, to the right in order to secure the nomination. Nothing at all wrong with that. But in the process, you hear an awful lot of he or she is not conservative enough. Maybe they're too liberal. We even ran into the rather amazing experience in the last presidential race when someone we all know and think highly of in the Republican primary chose to attack one of his opponents who later became the nominee of the Republican Party of being a liberal from Massachusetts and a predatory capitalist. Not Newt Gingrich's best day. Did not help in the general election, obviously, but it was part of the process we go through in trying to get the nomination within the party. There are a lot of different views of conservatism, economic conservatism. The others you all probably know as well, if not better than I, social conservatism. The Tea Party organization, different still. A lot of people identify with different groups within the Republican Party, different constituencies, that's good. You need people voting in order to win elections. But I suspect that what we have done entirely inadvertently is almost whoever the candidate may be, I would offer to you that the dumbest thing said by any Republican candidate becomes the definition not only of conservatism, but the definition of the Republican Party. And we spend most of the rest of the campaign trying to justify who we are. All the things that we talk about, whether it's women's health, between the liberal media and the party, the opposing party's campaign, we become anti-women. Whatever we say about immigration, we become anti-immigrant. Do the same thing with environmental issues and many more. I'm not suggesting that we're seeing the wrong thing as much as look at who is identifying us and defining us. It's the liberal media. It's the other party. And what are we doing to make sure we do, we control who we are. Do we really know from within, do we really understand exactly what conservatism is? I said earlier that I am a capitalist it's because capitalism is defined perhaps as well as I have ever seen it defined by what is on that plaque that we've just put down here. And I, will, I hope that I can remember it for heaven's sakes. But the primary cornerstones of this particular plaque, free markets, limited government, fiscal responsibility or restraint, and individual responsibility. Now, I think all of us as conservatives understand that, but is that the primary thing that people think about us, and more importantly, how much do each one of us really understand the meaning of those terms? And do we just say we're for free markets, or are we able to explain it to people? And do we go out of our way to make sure that we are identifying who we are, rather than letting our arch foes in the campaigns 
speak for us. Do we stand up whenever we can, starting around our own dining room table, starting with our own children, making sure that our colleagues in business and other pursuits really do understand the benefit of that. I like the idea that the Republican Party has a lot of other constituencies that think that they are also standing for conservatives. I'm not taking issue with that. I'm just simply saying I think it's important that we identify that one issue as being the thing that all of us rally around. It is the issue that binds all of us as conservatives together. And it is important that we are ready to stand up not only in saying out loud what we believe, but also by having the courage to take on anybody who is willing to stand up and attack us for having a philosophy that is the foundation of how this country was built, the strength of this nation, and I would defy anybody to show that we're not the party that ought to be, or the philosophy that ought to be driving America. Are we failing in our ability to teach our own children, the children of our neighbors and everyone else, not to tell them what they ought to be doing. They need some freedom. We also believe in that. But are we making sure they understand this particular philosophy? And I suggest to you, until we start doing that, until we start taking this message out to everyone else and defending who we are, we're going to continue having trouble at the polls. Because we are identified so clearly by our enemy, and they are pretty good at it. The political process that we've seen now over and over, if you say certain negative things about your opponent enough, the general public starts believing it. That campaign against us this last year took a man that I think most of us understand may not have been the perfect campaign, but certainly was the perfect person to be president in this particular time, extremely well qualified, a very, very decent person, he was identified and defined by the opposition, not by us, not by his campaign. Fault on both sides, but why would we allow that to continue happening? The only way we can stop it is for us as individuals, for people in a group like this across this country, making sure that we, are, that we understand first what conservatism really is. I say it's capitalism. Some of you who did not raise your hands, I suspect were a little bit reluctant to because capitalism is identified as somewhat of a bad term. I started to say I am a capitalist pig, for heaven's sakes, because that's what many people call people who have used that as a philosophy by which they have approached many things in life. But that's a term that is not applied by us internally. That's not a term that's ever applied by economists, certainly not conservative economists. But like everything else, we are identified by what other people say. Profits. Profits are a bad word in the lexicon of an awful lot of people that we're competing with. What's important for us to do is to understand the magic of the free market system. The invisible hand that Adam Smith talked about that drives success, that drives people who are willing to take a risk, that drives the marketplace to do the right thing, to keep prices low because competition will take the business away from you if you overprice. If you don't provide the best service, if you don't provide the best product, it is a self-correcting system that good heavens puts to pale the whole notion of a large government, particularly the federal government, making those decisions for you. I don't need to recite all the examples we've seen just recently. From Solyndra, you can't ever leave the post office out, but Obamacare as well, a whole portion of our economy being driven by people who simply do not have the background or the experience, but primarily government can't do it. The private sector can. That is what we ought to be talking about with a level of knowledge 
not only to explain it, but to say it passionately, strongly, convincingly. But I have come to the conclusion that the secondary school system, certainly the higher education system, is populated largely by people who historically have been pretty liberal. That's one reason I'm suggesting that we take the fight. I would love to be able to take it to the school system. Georgia has a pretty good system with the quality education program. Um, I don't know how well it works because I would hate to think about from grammar school, through high school, through higher education, the concepts that we're talking about here today being taught by teachers who probably don't agree with them. And I don't know how you get around that. I have quite frankly looked very seriously at everything from my own undergraduate school to others to see if there's a way to do that. I think this has to be a larger program driven by people like the people in this room in their own communities, teaching it however they can, but I don't think we can rely on the school systems to do it. Thank you for the question. Go Jason ahead. Halliburton, Marietta, Georgia. Um, I totally, it's more of a comment. I totally agree with what you're saying. And with my background being first generation American, I can say that a lot of the immigrants that come from the Caribbean islands and, and Africa are conservative. And the problem is, is that the message is not getting out to them of how to vote their values and beliefs. So I think that we as conservatives need to go out and stress the importance of going out there and knowing what conservatism is, how it resonates with you and your family, and how to vote for that right person. So I totally agree with what you're saying. That was almost as beautiful as your blessing. Thank you. I agree with you fully, and I think that's part of what we all have to realize. A lot of the constituencies that are somewhat written off in large measure because of the definition they apply to what we are has to be overcome by us. The national news media is not going to do it. Our opponents are not going to do it. But you have to understand what, we, what the message is. And I think the message of my message today, understand capitalism. Understand it. Do your homework. I'm not suggesting there's a single dumb soul in this room, but I guarantee you a surprising number of people say I'm for limited government. I'm for free enterprise. I'm for individual responsibility. But do they really know what it means? Can you sit down at the coffee table and talk to people about it? I think we have got to be able to do that. Marketing is important to everything we do. It also is a significant part of free enterprise, which is what we're talking about. You have to make sure that whatever the product is you're selling, call it conservatism, people have to like it. They don't like us very much right now. As a group, we are frowned upon by some conservative Republicans, some independents, and a whole lot of people who are getting all of their information from people who have a very distinct agenda to defeat us. So how you go about doing that, I, you know, I can sit here for the next three or four hours and talk more about Economics 101 and that type thing, but I am deliberately not, I don't want to bore you any more than I already have. I want to make sure that we all come together and hear the kind of comments we're hearing on the floor right now and then decide what are we going to do about it. I'm going to return to one comment that was made earlier. Patrick, I think it may have been, been you, and I don't want to get overly dramatic with this, but let me ask one more question. How many of you remember that great movie? Close uh, not New Network, I guess was the name of it. Raise your hand if you remember what I'm talking about. You will remember it when I start telling you about it. It was a movie in the mid-70s, a uh, okay. anchor, a news anchor with a uh, national television audience got fed up. I'm suggesting we ought to be fed up right now. One night, just completely unplanned, sp spontaneously, he literally stood up from his anchor desk and said, I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take it any longer. And he persisted. He worked himself into a frenzy. He walked around the floor of the newsroom, and he was speaking to a national audience. And he said, rise up, do something, go to your windows, raise the windows, yell to the people outside, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. 
that's the kind of spirit I think, Patrick, we've got to generate somehow among people who feel the way we do. Let's quit sitting back. Let's quit being, we ought to be civil in everything we do, but we're fighting people that are fighting on a different field than we're on, and we've got to realize this is big league politics. Pol politics can be very, very brutal. I'm not suggesting that we play the same game our foes play, but we gotta confront it head on. I have thoroughly enjoyed being with you. I appreciate the participation you have shown, and again, Molly, I hope you know from the comments that I've made how much I value the award that you and your board have presented to me today. Thank all of you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a generous thank you to Mr. Frederick Cooper.